Hello, everybody. Um, I guess we'll start with introductions. My name is Wyatt Joyner. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So I'm that's it. That's that's the panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> uh, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, so I'm an algorithms engineer for a graph database company. Can I, can people in the back actually hear me? All right, cool. Uh, so for a graph database company, I'm not gonna explain what a graph database is, but we are gonna talk about graphs. Um, yeah. So I'm Simon Whittle. Uh, I work as a consultant primarily in data science-y uh, operations research simulation development for a federal contractor. Uh, we will not be explaining what the federal government is to you today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have been interested in game development for some time, just doing little hobby projects, game jams, that type of thing. Uh, and the types of games that we like to make um, are based on like really simple rules, but uh, you know, depthy, emergent gameplay. Um, if you're familiar with cellular automata, which of course you are, um, basically um, they use very simple rules for replication or deletion of colors or p values on a grid, and they produce really wild, complex, completely chaotic patterns. So you kind of get this insane complexity from a very small set of very simple rules. Now some games that do this sort of thing where relatively simple rules combine to create complex emergent gameplay tend to be old school roguelikes or uh, more modern colony simulators like Dwarf Fortress. Uh, now, of course, Dwarf Fortress has been in development for 20 years. And what we like to think about is we, we don't want to spend that kind of time. So uh, we, we've been spending a bunch of time thinking about what an engine might look like that can uh, be well suited to making this kind of game in less time with less effort. So we tried using graphs for this. Is it going to work? I don't know. Is it kind of working? Yeah. Are we going to talk about it? I hope so. What is a graph? So um, a good place to start. Uh, so a graph is defined as a collection of vertices and edges. So the vertices are the little circle guys on the screen, and the edges are the lines between them. Um, now, this is just an abstract mathematical object. Usually, you want it to represent something. So if we're talking about a social network like Facebook, the vertices might represent users. And then the edges between them represent uh, you know, friendships. You know, if, one, if user A is a friendship of user B, you have an edge between them. And it's sparse. So if two users have nothing to do with one another, there's no edge. The graph, you don't need to represent it. Um, and the ed you can have different types of edges as well. Uh, and it can be completely heterogeneous. Um, so um, a specific application of graphs um, is the storage of domain-specific knowledge. So, and these are called knowledge graphs. Uh, they exist in a wide variety of, of use cases. So they're like biomedical knowledge graphs that store information about diseases and drugs and how they interact with one another. Some notable examples here are the Google knowledge graph. So Google has a knowledge graph consisting of billions and billions of facts represented as vertices and edges, and this, help, this helps augment uh, Google's search results. Another pretty popular example is ConceptNet, which I think started out as open source. It's now like semi-open source. Um, it's just a giant accumulation of knowledge that I believe was started by MIT, and a lot of different, you, you know, you can, you can imagine, there are a lot of different use cases for general knowledge uh, stored in this way. Um, so this little example here is storing like cultural or geographic knowledge as a graph. Um, but what if you decided to represent a game as a graph? Is this a good idea? Yeah, so we do think that there are in fact benefits to doing so. And uh, the first of these we want to discuss is how uh, it can help you control misalignment when it comes to AI and the agents in your game. So uh, before we dive into it, we're going to note we do not mean misalignment as it is used in the um, data science, machine learning research space that has a very specific technical meaning. We're not using it in that way. We're using it specifically to mean when game agents have an incomplete or incorrect representation of the game state that is driving their decision making. So here, the adoring fan uh, just simply does not understand the cliff, the gravity. And it drives him to make 
a poor decision, which is to walk off the cliff and become subject to the gravity. Now, uh, we think that the graph representation can help us handle this. Primarily, it helps us handle this due to its, uh, right, due to its sparsity. So because the cliff and the gravity are not really being represented as cliff and gravity, we're focusing in on the gameplay relevant parts of the game state, we can avoid or control the misalignment behaviors. So if there's no walls, you're not going to get stuck on them. Yeah, so this, th this would be sparsely representing the situation. Mm -hmm. you know. um, there's no possibility that he falls off the cliff if you don't have any variables in the game to basically represent that state. Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, let's talk about tags for a little bit, because a lot of games use tags or typing systems for dynamic behavior. So um, tags are basically labels that you can assign to objects in your game, uh, and this can help modify the behavior or what actions can be performed on those items. So you've probably played a game or you know of games that have crafting systems. A lot of those crafting systems might not look for particular items, but might look for items that have a certain type or items that have a certain tag. Um, like, is this, is this item wooden? Is this a binding agent? Can this be used in this crafting recipe? So it's just like a type check, basically. And this is great if you have a really simple, you know, one-to-many assignment of tags and items. But what if it's a little more complex than that? What if you want to have relationships between the tags? So compatibility. Um, tag A and tag B are not compatible with each other. You don't want any item to inherit from both of those tags. That would be a relationship between those two tags. What about entailment? If you have tag A and tag B, that implies that you must have tag C. That's, once again, a relationship between those type entities, not between your individual objects. So it's pretty easy to represent those types of rules as a graph. So here's a simple example of compatibility. We have two items, birch and granite, um, which are raw materials. Uh, birch is a type of wood, granite's a type of stone, uh, and any raw material has invokes this particular rule, the one of rule, which says that any raw material can only have one of the raw material types, wood, stone, iron. And this is completely dynamic, and it's just represented as data. We didn't statically define this as, like, um, if you're familiar with programming, we didn't statically define this with types um, or predefined dictionaries. It's like runtime data, which is pretty cool. Um, then uh, entailment, this is another very simple example. So magnetite is a type of resource which contains both stone and iron. Uh, um, and um, these raw material types uh, inherit the multiple entails rule, which means that if you have multiple uh, raw material types, then that entails that the item is a composite item. That might be useful if you have traders in your game who are interested in composite items or only interested in pure items. Um, so you can actually get a lot of bang for your buck with these simple rules encoded as a graph. So. Another thing that we think this can help us with is uncertainty modeling. So game agents are oftentimes presented with situations that they do not have a well-defined response for. Uh, in those cases, oftentimes an agent will just behave buggily or perhaps just not really react much at all in a somewhat boring fashion. So what do you do if you see this? Well, if you are a graph brain, you might think of it like this. So in your graph brain, you are consuming the scene as a set of physical manifested observable things and some information you know about those things or some preconceived notions you have about those things. And in this particular case, there is information missing, right? A man is feeding a blob to another guy. What's, what's that? What's that doing? <laughs> so the idea is that if you have a graph brain and you can use your graph brain to consume this information, you can start to infer missing information. 
for example, here, your preconceived notions might tell you that this is bad. Force feeding is kind of a violent action, and, uh, you know, blobs are a bit uncertain, so that might make you uncomfortable. And there might be other things that tell you uh, how you should think about this. So you might start and infer that the consequences of this action are bad for man, too. This is a bad, dangerous situation that you should be afraid of. Now, the most important part about this uncertainty modeling is that it is not objective. This is a guess. And once you see the objective consequences of the situation, that inference can be replaced. And the graph brain in this case might see that actually the blob heals the second man. And then you get to rethink some of your preconceived notions about the situation and perhaps learn, and at the very least, act in an interesting way when you've been presented with an unfamiliar situation. So uh, this might sound extremely complex and impossible, but it isn't. It's actually done all the time across a wide variety of enterprise use cases. Um, I think this is a pretty poignant example. This is about drug repurposing. And this is, by the way, like this is what I do for a living like 90% of the time. Like, a lot, of, a lot of companies are interested in this type of problem. So it's called link prediction. So you have an incomplete graph, and you're trying to infer whether there's some missing information or missing relationships between the entities in the graph. So drug repurposing can be framed as this type of problem. You have vertices representing drugs. You have vertices representing diseases. You know that some drugs do treat certain diseases. Um, you know that some drugs might be incompatible with one another because they have bad interactions. Um, and you might know that some diseases are quite similar to one another based on their properties. Um, and then basically using the context of that graph, there are various techniques you can use, which I'm not going to get into, but um, the goal of this problem is to predict that, oh, this drug can be repurposed for this disease, which we hadn't previously tried out before. And if you're curious, I'm pretty sure this is how remdesivir was repurposed as a drug for COVID-19, um, just as a kind of topical example, I guess. <laughs> Um, okay, so we know what we want. Um, this has some technical implications, which we'll go over pretty quickly. Um, so we know that we want these game agents um, to have like sparse representations of reality, and we also want them to have the faculty to um, produce inferences. Um, and sometimes those inferences can be wrong, but that might be interesting. Two subjective agents that have a different view of the same situation producing divergent behavior is conflict, and, that, and conflict is fun. So <laughs> that, 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 that's what we're going for. Um, so, since we want unique representations for each agent, um, this is the architecture that we've settled on. At the top of the diagram, we have, but we also, sorry, let me just explain, we also want a little bit of consistency in this representation as well. Um, we, don't, we don't just want it to go completely off the rails and subjective agents living in their own, you know, uh, Cartesian solipsistic worlds. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, at the top of the graph, at the top of the diagram here, we have an objective graph. So this is kind of like the true game state represented as a graph. And then we have these agent graphs or these subjective graphs reading and interacting with the subjective graph. So those agent brains represent subjective lenses on the objective state of the game. It might be possible to design this type of architecture, where you do just have a bunch of subjective brains trying to synchronize their information with one another and just decohering immediately and then drifting off into their own uh, nonsense worlds, which might be fun, but uh, that's not exactly the kind of game we want to make. So naturally, once you implement an engine like the one we are describing, there are gameplay implications for doing so. Um, naturally, as you... Uh, represent the game state as a graph, it becomes sparse, right? You're not having a big open world where there's a field full of grass textures and trees and so on, uh, but we don't think you lose much by going from that to just some graph of points of interest because on top of that sparse graph, you can build enough rules and interesting interactions as to produce fun gameplay. Another uh, gameplay implication that we are going with from this engine is a turn-based or lockstep game. We think that simply by the nature of the UI UX problems that representing game state as a graph presents, uh, you want it to be a relatively systems-focused game where you 
have plenty of time to look at the information being presented to you. So, uh, how did we make this engine? We made a <laughs> Python prototype. So, um, yeah, we built a Python prototype, and uh, if there are any recruiters out there, it is not a reflection of our professional capacity. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the engine architecture uh, of of this of this engine. Um, so, first, an assumption that any game built in this engine is going to have to satisfy um, or fulfill these three pillars. So, the subjective and objective concept maps. So, um, you'll have instances in the game, but instances will always be defined by the concepts that they inherit from. And also note that those concepts can also inherit from each other or interact with each other in differing ways. Um, and just to reiterate the point that this is sparse, so if you don't have, you know, if there's no need to represent the concept of hunger in your game, it doesn't have to be represented in the graph. Um, so that's, that's nice. <laughs> um, then uh, action rules. So um, now we're getting kind of into uh, more details about um, how you encode functionality in this game. So it's not just storage, it's also you know, computation as well. So uh, action rules are basically, uh, it's just pattern matching in the graph. So the way this works is a subjective agent will pattern match for a particular, well, graph pattern, a sequence of vertex and edge types. And based on the presence or, ac or absence of those subgraphs in the graph, um, certain actions will be made available or unavailable to that agent. So a couple of examples. If we have a vertex in the graph, uh, graph representing the fact that combat is going on, we might know that several different actions are incompatible with combat. You can't strike up a friendly conversation if someone's trying to strangle you. So title drop, boom, that's how you resist the primal urge to greet somebody who's strangling you. With a graph. <laughs> Yeah, well, all going together now. <laughs> okay. Um, another rule is like, you know, friendship prevents combat. Um, so if you are friends with somebody, then uh, you can't try to knife them in the throat. Unless your brain permits that, which is pretty cool. You, you can design psychopaths in this game, in this uh, engine. <laughs> the last pillar that you might want to focus, you will want to focus on when uh, designing a game is effect and update rules. So this is defined as... Um, when a graph receives an update, so a new person enters the room, or a new friendship is made, or combat has begun, um, the addition of that uh, little graph delta there um, should update your graph in a specific way. So um, you can define rules such that like, when a person enters the room, I want to initialize an unknown relationship with them. Or when I perform a conversation action, I want to initialize a conversation object in the graph. So it's kind of like, given, this, uh, given the addition of this graph pattern, I want to make this change to my graph. Um, so yeah, I guess, th yeah I, I guess these are examples here. If a person gets wounded twice, then they might die. That's, that might be a rule that you have, which is... It it's also important to note that some of these rules can belong to the subjective realities, while others belong to the objective realities. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if a person is getting wounded and they die, that is an objective rule, whereas conversation doesn't really exist. It's just a product of our, you know, subjective social constructs. So, um... Once you've developed those three parts of the game, you, so you developed your concept maps, you developed your action rules, which like you know prune down the action space for each agent, and then you define your effect rules, which dictate how the graphs update in response to changes. Um, this is how it all comes together. Um, so we have these containers for graphs called realities, or we could call them brains if you want. So we've got the objective reality and then the subjective realities, which contain graphs, which represent their state. Um, and then there's a lot of message passing between these realities, um, and that's basically how the game evolves and how dynamic gameplay happens. Um, so this is what the basic game loop is going to look like for any game made in this engine. So first, a subjective brain is going to pare down the action space given its current state. So like I said, you know, a conversation is going on. I cannot knife them in the throat because that's not appropriate. Um, so I've pruned down my action space to some viable set of actions. I select an action, and then I send, I send that proposal to the objective graph. So person one says, I want to 
talk about this thing with this with person number two. Um, the objective graph, uh, the objective reality, receives that message, and then it has effect rules which dictate how it's supposed to update its state in response to that message. And then after it's updated its state, it then propagates the true state to those subjective graphs. And then the subjective graphs do the same thing when they receive the message. They have their own effect rules, which dictate how they respond to that information. So an interesting thing to note is a conversation might not be an objective thing. The detection of a conversation might just be a subjective thing. Or a relationship between two people might not be represented in the, in the objective graph. It might just be something you subjectively create. Um, in response to these graph updates. Um, and like I said, when two different characters have different subjective states, that can generate interesting gameplay where, you know, I think we're friends and you don't think we are. You think we're enemies. And so you try to attack me and I'm shocked. Um, that type of, you know, dynamic stuff. Yes? Yes. So, um, yeah, th th that's yeah. So the objective graph. So t technically, it's all under. Well, it's all it's all designed to be under the control of the developer. You define the effect rules for both the objective graph and the subjective graph. But yes, the objective state um, is like the thing that the developer has like the most control over and is like uh, the most concrete thing in in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and then. Um, I guess to get, yeah, I, th I think this might also kind of answer your question as well. As a player, you don't see the objective graph. You just see your subjective representation of what's going on, which is kind of cool. This, we can do really neat things like simulate genuine madness in the brain, of a, in the subjective brain, um, you know, even though the, the objective state might be perfectly normal. Um, Yeah, yeah, effectively, perceive it or fail to perceive it spectacularly, sometimes, as the case may be. If you're crazy. Right. Yeah, or if somebody has cast an illusory spell upon you, or what have you. If you're blind, yeah. Yeah, yeah, naturally. Um, so it's, it's all well and cool that you have this storage and computation going on in the back end, but how is a player supposed to actually interact with this? Well, we built a little demo. <laughs> So uh, you're not going to see the graph, but uh, you are going to see a really poorly made Python demo. <laughs> you're going to see a prompt. So the, the, the back end here is a graph. So um, in this little demo, we have three characters in a room. So and I, I don't know if you guys can see. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, can you? Uh, Whoa, how about that? <laughs> you couldn't do that in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, this information is all represented as a graph, but for human readability, it's all just you know parsed from the graph and then uh, printed out here. So you are in a calm context. You have an unknown relationship with person zero, and you have an unknown relationship with person 10. And you have this array of actions that you can take um, given this state of your graph. So uh, we will offer some friendly small talk to person A. <laughs> I will select that. Da -da -da. Uh, I will have the other entity. So um, I, I, I have uh, the way we've configured this demo. It's just a human character controlling all three people. Um, it doesn't matter how you select these actions. It could be a human person just looking at the options and selecting them, or you could use a reinforcement learning agent to try to you know pick actions based on what's available. Or you could choose randomly. Or you could choose randomly. That's that's fun. Um, we'll just have these characters wait for now because I just want to show you guys how the graph updates. So. Um, Characters 0 and 10 waited, and character number 5 uh, offered some friendly small talk to character number 10. So this is now um, character number 5's state. You are in a conversation context. You have an unknown relationship with character number 0, and you have a friendly relationship with character number 10. And if you'll notice, the graph state has actually changed, or the action space has actually changed. Uh, okay, so the characters are called 0, 5, and 10. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, if you notice, the action space has actually changed. So in the first round, when we were just in a calm context with 
unknown relationships, we had the ability to engage those enemies and um, start a combat. But now that we're in a conversation context and we have a friendly relationship with that person, we no longer have that option. So we've pruned the action space down to what's appropriate. And this is entirely at the discretion of the developer. You might want total freedom for your players and allow them to take combat actions whenever. Allow them to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, and this is how most open world games are designed, but that might not be narratively conducive. Yeah. <laughs> So let's repeat, just, ask the, just so people heard the question. Um, you, can have, uh, you can have totally different rules for your player's subjective brain and any NPC's subjective brain. Yes, absolutely. That's the, yeah, yes, and, that, and that's the entire point. Each subjective brain can have their own set of rules and therefore their own unique graph state, their own unique perception on the situation. Um, and let's actually show. So if I just wait as character number five, um, who did I talk to? I talked to character number 10. So this is character number zero who had nothing to do with the situation. This is now character number 10 who understands that they're in a conversation context, but they're still in an unknown relationship. Um, so, you know, th th now, once again, these are just the rules that we defined. Just because someone offers you some friendly small talk doesn't mean that you're friendly with them. Uh, it might make they them think that they're friendly with you, but... Um, you know, this is a discrepancy between these two characters' uh, representation on what's going on. So this character still has the engage action, for instance. Was there a question? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it's going to break if I try it, because this demo is really poorly made. <laughs> <laughs> well, because as, as I was... Very good question. Let, yeah. Let's repeat the question. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Really good question. <laughs> so... What is the objective state when the two subjective characters disagree on whether or not they're friends? Uh, in this case, five thinks that they're friends with ten, and ten thinks that they have an un unknown relationship with five. Well, uh, this gets back to what I was saying about how some rules are applied in objective reality, some rules are applied in subjective reality, and some concepts just don't ob exist objectively. Conversation and friendship in the world we have made in the ontology we have defined are not objective realities. There is no power of friendship. It does not objectively <laughs> exist. It exists only in your mind. If you believe- Welcome to the real world. There second. is no friendship. No, it exists if you believe in it. That's the power. <laughs> so you can go through the game and convince everybody to be friends with each other and that's, that's, that's our game. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, okay. Oh, who was first? Let's oh, go left goodness. to right. Left? <laughs> right. So that's a good question. The question is if friendship does not exist in objective reality and deltas start at objective reality and then are propagated to subjective reality, how does friendship get added to subjective reality? Well, the answer is uh, with those effect rules. We said that when a, a graph delta comes into a reality, you run your effect rules. In this case, it is the action of small talk that is being added to subjective reality. The subjective entity accepts and realizes that small talk has occurred, therefore they run the rule that says, now I'm friends with you because I'm small talking with you. And what's happening effectively is that you are not then running a rule that says, ah yes, because you small talked me, I'm friends with you too. There could be a brain that has that rule, right? Some people could be friends with the people who small talk them. Some people could not. And that's where we get into the heterogeneous, you know, subjective realities that can disagree about things. So I'm going to stop the demo before it breaks. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Right. Um, do, you, do you need to like stop it at some level because you don't want to go a step further? I imagine and like, oh well, that person just saw us and gave me a small talk. Therefore, uh, <laughs> they think that we're. You know, yeah, so this is a great question, and I'll, I'll, I'll iterate it again. Um, the question is, the third person in the room, they just saw the two people engage in small talk. Do they de then think to themselves, oh, that person started having small talk with that person. That didn't make me friends with either of them, but I know that probably they're friends with each other. Um, I don't know. Do we want to answer that now? Because we, we actually... we speak a little bit about that question later on the slides. Do we want to handle it now? Or? So, yeah, so uh, I guess really quickly, I'll just say that it comes down to the question of how do subjective brains represent the state of others' subjective brains? Yeah. Um, and that's a big open question. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can handle it. The way that we're handling it in the current demo is um, kind of superficial. You just kind of assume that everybody else has the same brain that you have. And so... Um, you have the same rule. When somebody small talks somebody else, that makes them think that they're friends with this person. And that's where you stop, you stop iterating. You stop saying, you know, well, this person thinks they're friends. Does that person also think that this person thinks that they're friends? You, you, you don't iterate any, you don't, you don't recurse any, any, any further than that. You just stop at saying this person thinks that they're friends. And then when that person performs the action, that person thinks that they're friends. So it's like a very shallow representation of other brains. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. So we, we have other <laughs> thoughts for how we could do it in a more sophisticated way. We might talk, touch on those later with time. The recursion? So the question is whether or not we could do that recursion if we wanted to. That would be on us as developers choosing how to write the rules, right? We could write a bunch of rules for subjective brains to have them start thinking about what they're seeing other people do to each other and start trying, you know, to build a theory of mind where they imagine what, you know, that you know that the cookie is in the box or I, I forget what that. <laughs> I would fail the theory of mind problem at 11 p.m. on the Friday of MAGFest. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so mostly at the discretion of the developer, yeah. although we do have a couple of things to add to the engine to facilitate that type yeah. of representation. So, right. We also want to talk about other cool mechanics that we could build in the current state of our engine. Uh, we've shown you what we actually have, and we believe that we could implement some other cool mechanics in its present state, apart from, I guess, some of the brokenness. but. We're going to step through some ideas we have. So first off, consider cannibalism. <laughs> Great stuff, cannibalism. Uh, so the interesting thing about cannibalism <laughs> is when you're a cannibal, uh, you see bodies as edible. This is what a cannibal brain looks like when the cannibal is a graph. Uh, the body can be dead, right? Generally speaking, you're not going to eat uh, a living, but the dead body is an edible snack to the cannibal brain. Now, normal people like you all uh, would see it more like this. You would know that eating dead bodies is kind of gross and yucky and you don't like it. So you would not have the edge between deadness and edible snackitude. And if you saw somebody doing eating actions on dead bodies, you would know to immediately think, oh God, oh God, there's a cannibal here. That's a really bad kind of person to be in a room with. So yeah, I guess just to draw it back to the engine, this would be implemented as some kind of effect rule. So the pattern that you'd be looking for is eating a dead body, presumably a dead body belonging to a human, previously belonging to a human. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, you'd look for that pattern, and then in response to that pattern, you would, you know, maybe spawn some type of edge representing revulsion towards the person, the, towards the, you know, the uh, the source of that action. Um, another cool mechanic we could uh, we can talk about uh, depersonalization. So uh, a normal person like this fine gentleman here. Um, maps like uh, y y you might have a concept for things that you respect and you know that you shouldn't kill things that you respect and you might in general respect humanity but uh, when you s <laughs> when you gaze upon the elder gods uh, when they appear to you um, 
the following thing might happen. Um, you know, just by the by, by the the. <laughs> I guess by the uh, by, by whatever rules Lovecraftian horror operates, you see the Elder Gods. Your mind is you know your, the, your concept map itself is rewritten, and suddenly you no longer view humanity as the center of your respect, but the Elder Gods themselves. And you know humanity, the concept of humanity is shunted aside um, and is now entirely disposable. So um, the the concept map which might have prevented you from you know, treating people like ants and just killing them when they get in your way, um, the, the concept map that prevented you from acting like that can be rewritten as an effect rule of just seeing the Elder Gods. So if you're making a Lovecraftian horror type game, um, you can absolutely do this like natively in the engine. Um, which is pretty neat. We can represent genuine madness yeah. in a way. Yeah, what we think is neat about it is that we're not simulating the madness with some abstract mechanic like a sanity bar, we are directly representing in the data structure that holds the ideology and worldview of the agent, we are applying the effects of Lovecraftian madness to them. Yeah, 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 I think I think I get what you're saying. So can you have the creeping suspicion? So what you're asking is, can you still have some meter that gates the arrival of this change? And I think ultimately what what that would probably be driven by is the kind of inference that we've talked about earlier, right? There's missing information when you see the Elder Gods. That's what Lovecraft is about. You see something and it is a horror beyond your comprehension. You do not have the concepts in your concept map to withhold, to, to hold the Elder Gods. And so you could, in an Eldritch style game with this system, have the creeping s suspicion be, as you see more and more incongruous things, what you're coming to realize is this. The inference is building up that, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. In order for what I'm seeing to make sense, this has to be reality, right? You're constantly seeing how grand and vast and what have you the Elder Gods are, and you're like, wait, grand vastness so much more so than the puny tininess of humanity that doesn't that doesn't mesh with the whole respect of humanity thing and you can infer to solve that slowly over time realizing that the solution is that it's the elder gods who deserve respect because they're the ones that have the grandness etc i'd like to just clip this portion of the panel where we're just talking yeah, about we're like, just <laughs> oh with this slide <laughs> guys don't you see don't you see <laughs> The creeping suspicion. Uh, I don't remember what the next slide is. So okay, yeah, yeah. Um, stuff that we could do in the future uh, on, right. in the long term. Well, and specifically stuff for which we would have to extend or expand the model. We don't have implemented things to do this. So I'll I'll, I'll keep this pretty short. Um, and I'm not going to get too technical about it, but uh, motivation in someone's mind is a pretty interesting thing. So um, if you do want to represent hunger as a concept, then um, the motivation to resolve that hunger uh, might also be represented as a concept. And in the abstract, um, the type of plan that that might generate is, I need to search for something physical that satisfies this physical need. Like that, that would be the very abstract way of putting this. And so I might define some type of protocol for, um, I, I might define some type of protocol for addressing that abstract need, and then um, by plugging in the parameters of hunger and the context of the situation, I can kind of uh, implement or resolve that abstract plan um, in, in, in the actual game itself, like w when you're faced with a real situation. Um, the, um, it's a, it's a I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty abstract concept itself, planning and motivation, um, but there's some really neat things you can do with graphs when you talk about like you know representing the motivations themselves as uh, vertices. 
Um, we already talked a little bit about this, but internally simulating other brains. So how do you as a subjective agent represent the state of other subjective agents? In the current system, we're just you know, doing it very superficially. Uh, one idea that we had was, what if you kind of cheat? What if like subjective brains get the ability to actually peak, they get an incomplete peak at, at the actual state of other subjective brains? Um, and kind of the longer you've had, the, the more exposure that you've had to that person, the more complete or the more correct that peak will actually be. Um, so that's pretty cool. One, because it's memory saving. You don't have to copy a representation of every other person's brain in the room just to figure out what their state is. You can actually look directly at that memory without having to um, you know, replicate it. Now, regardless oh, yeah. Absolutely, we love lies. <laughs> yes. So the the question being the statement being made, the question being asked is, uh, could that peak be given as the result of a conversation? Can you intentionally start injecting nodes into somebody else's brain? Yeah, yeah, we, we would like that kind of system when we think that kind of system is exactly what helps make a game built with these approaches shine. Uh, you can dynamically lie to NPCs and based on the kind of brain they have and their relationship with you, they can choose when they get updates from you. Do I believe it? Do I not believe it? Am I going to tag it with I'm a little suspicious of this idea. You know, you can start tracking the uh, the source of information. Is it your eyes? Is it somebody else? Is it third hand from another person? Uh, there's a lot of interesting semantic information you can store about how you know things. Yeah, so um, one, one thing you can decide to represent as vertices and edges is, I, I guess what we've been saying is like the mode of ascertainment. Yeah. So how did you come to know this knowledge? Did somebody tell it to you? Somebody Did somebody trustworthy tell it to you? Or is it somebody that you despise and is likely to lie to you, tell this to you? Or did you actually observe it with your own eyes? Um, and the, you know, the, the, the vertex representing that mode of ascertainment might then influence the degree of confidence to which you actually believe that event or that observation to be true. Pretty cool. Um, right. Right. Yeah, we could, you could implement it in a number of ways. You know, you can add attribute maps to your vertices or your edges and what have you to store that kind of floating point information to say, oh, I have this percent confidence in this edge or in this vertex. You could implement it that way. Or we, we kind of like the discretization of gameplay concepts here, where you, instead of having floating values, you bucket things discreetly. Oh, this is something I'm mostly sure about, or I am kind of suspicious of, and so on. But you're right that it also plays into the creeping suspicion, because another way you could go mad in that situation is you start to disbelieve in the evidence of your own eyes. You cannot trust your own, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I didn't hear the I didn't hear the second half of the question. Are you I, uh, could you could you come up? Is, is it okay if you'd come up? <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, 
Can you repeat the question? So the the question is, how do you handle conflicting nodes? So presumably you don't want an NPC fighting everybody they see, but there are some people they see that need to be fought. And so I think the idea there is that there would presumably be two conflicting rules, the rule to don't just fight anybody and the rule to fight people oh, who need to be fought. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. So that, that would also kind of be at the discretion of the developer to ensure that their effect rules don't just result in a completely contradictory graph state. Um, which, you know, that, that, that's a problem. There are only so many guardrails that we can, you know, expose to a, to a game developer to make them not do that. But, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's going to be a prevalent problem no matter which paradigm you use. Uh, you know, uh, an AI is always going to be able to, if you code it poorly enough, an AI is always going to be able to have, you know, completely conflicting rules. One way you might address that is you might just uh, indicate, like, priority of these concepts. Mm -hmm. So it might be more important to you that they're a bandit than the general respect that you have for mankind. <laughs> Um, another interesting thing is memory summarization. So um, all of the actions that have happened in a particular scenario, they persist as vertices and edges in the graph. So we need to, ha we need to come up with some way of basically taking all those actions, um, maybe figuring out which concepts they were largely associated with, and then summarizing that as like a single point. So maybe you got into a room, you got into a terrible scrap, the person beat the crap out of you, and then stole all your money. <laughs> That's a very bad thing to have happened to you. Very, very bad traumatic event to have happened to you. So maybe you just summarize that entire event as a really bad day. Um, right. So that would be kind of like memory summarization. We, we don't want to store all the memory as, in, as, in, as granularly as possible at all times. Um, you, don't, you don't have to remember every single blow that the person who stole your money landed. You just need to remember that it happened and maybe a few relevant facts about them, like their license plate number. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so the the question here is you could have um a a granular memory of recent time and then a summarized memory of past time. I think that would be absolutely essential to having this system work. And that's how, you know, we mentioned Dwarf Fortress for example earlier, that's how it works in that game. The dwarves have a rather colorful short-term memory that can hold everything from, you know, fighting with a spouse to drinking some nice ale uh, or getting caught in the rain. And then if need be, they can then elevate those short-term memories into long-term memories of getting caught in the rain. So much so that they hate nature to the point that they want it to all be destroyed and burned down. This keeps happening to my dwarves. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm super interested in building a game that the whole point is you have an unreliable perception of reality. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I, and there's so many different ways you can go with that. I, I, I think the coolest thing about this system is that you can natively represent the distortion of reality, like just using using the game state itself. So um, yeah, it's th yeah, that's kind of what the system. That's kind of what we had in mind almost when we first came up with this, mm -hmm. this paradigm. Yeah. Um, Entity aggregation at dynamic granularity. So what we mean about this is um, it might become very computationally infeasible if we have um, you know a thousand agents all in a giant field and they all have to have you know a completely granular you know depiction of what's going on with ev with respect to every single person uh, you know in in that environment. Yeah. So it it, it would just it would be. It, it would be computationally infeasible, and even if we could do it, it would be uh, unreadable and unmanageable for a player. It uh, would also be irrelevant, right? We've spoken before about how we like the way the graph pairs the game state down to what's relevant to the player. You're not representing every tree in the field, you're representing the points of interest. If there's a crowd in the city square, you don't need to see every person, you need to see the crowd until a specific person in the crowd becomes relevant to the player. And so dynamic granularity there means, you know, the promotion of a single individual in the crowd to a point of interest where you can see them 
as distinct from the crowd. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so the question is like, does that also mean that the um, the, the group um, kind of acts as as as, a, as an agent itself? Um, so this would depend on the type of game that you're making. Um, if you are, this would be this would be something you implement as an effect rule on the objective reality. Mm -hmm. I think one game where this would make a lot of sense is um, some type of colony management or you know four uh, X game. Um, where maybe you can zoom in on like your home base and you know you can view all the individual you know colony members um, but if you zoom out the other you know uh, you know like branch fortifications that you have are represented at a very low granularity so you might have these other outposts which are kind of the agent is the outpost itself and kind of when you zoom out it's just acting as an outpost agent at, at a much more at a lower resolution Yeah. I mean, that's the level game that you see. Yeah. yeah, you got the idea. And and, so, and th these are just be specific game design, um, you know, or specific game designs. Yeah, game specific. And of course, what's neat about entity aggregation, that can also be you. Let's say, you know, you're making your colony and then your colony gets bigger and then you stop caring about the individuals and now not just your outposts, but you are now less granular and so on. Um, and then lastly, procedural generation. Um, Specifically, using uh, graphs and like probabilistic correlation um, is a really neat concept. So, um, I, get, I think like w what I mean by this is um, if you were trying to generate um, a village, then a village might highly correlate with the presence of villagers, and the fact that it takes place in a swamp might highly correlate with the presence of a particular kind of villager. Um, and this particular kind of villager might highly correlate with the presence of some other thing or with the presence of some other sub property of the village. So um, you can, it's kind of like a Bayesian net, a Bayesian network, um, which is a, a graphy way to, just to show cause and effect or just correlation between variables. So you can basically say, I want these variables to be locked in, and now I want to generate the rest of the graph, given that I know that these variables are true. So I know I want a village, I know I want it to, take, I know I want it to be in a swamp, I want to let the graph figure out all the other details and just generate an instance for me. So this is a pretty cool way that you could um, structure those rules in a graph. And just general Q&A, yeah. <laughs> I guess we've already been doing that. <laughs> oh. So I think I think the key thing to bear well, the, in mind here well, the is question. This, you should say the yes, question. Yes, sorry. The question. What can this do that another game engine can't? Like Dwarf Fortress is built in a particular way. What can this do that Dwarf Fortress can't? Um and I think the answer is really it's not a question of what the engines can do, it's a question of what they should do. Just the the engine should be able to do what you want it to. You could use some of the underpinnings of this engine to drive the AI in, say, a first-person shooter, right? But it would just be unsuited to that use case. So the, you know, the the 
the Halo elites that you're shooting don't don't need to be modeled with this subjective reality where oh they they thought that you were a bush therefore they didn't notice you and shoot at you you know you just implement that with a different mechanic similarly I don't think it's that this can do things that are completely impossible to do otherwise it's just a question of making it easier to implement for the developer so you can make more of these juicy mechanics with, uh, you know, it's mo a more bang for your buck equation. Um, I'm not sure if, Wyatt, do you Well, I guess one, one thing to say, just um, Dwarf Fortress is a highly simulationist game. Yeah. So it has a lot of variables playing into, uh, you know, uh, I guess playing into the, the, the game loop. So like temperature and humidity and all those other variables that don't, in they my, don't matter. In they my don't opinion, matter. if you if you wanted to make a really narrative game about dwarves, you don't necessarily need to represent the body temperature of a carp five miles downstream. Um, but Dwarf Fortress does. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So because if you put it in lava, Dwarf Fortress wants to know if it's going to melt. So yes, the, it will. So if, if if you actually if you wanted a if you do want a highly simulationist, true to life representation of dwarves, then. Um, I mean, Dwarf Fortress is going to do that because it, 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 it really does simulate all these variables. If you want something, you know, narratively focused, but you don't necessarily care how it arrived at that outcome, then just sparsely representing the variables that matter and then designing rules to operate on that sparse set of variables could be sufficient to produce something just as narratively depthy as Dwarf Fortress, but maybe not as simulationist as Dwarf Fortress. It's also worth bearing in mind that the weight of all the computation that Dwarf Fortress does is, in reality, it's a huge problem for the game. Once you have like 250 dwarves, it practically stops running. When you do something like this and you have your entity aggregation and you have your memory aggregation and things like that, you, you reduce the load from a, a data and processing standpoint of handling the kinds of complexities that produces cool stuff. I want to have a whole city of dwarves, not just, you know, 200 little, little drunk bastards. Um, and presumably, you know, once you get to a whole city, you might stop caring about the miner and start caring more about the miner's guild. And this system does that a bit better. Mm. Uh, okay, I'll answer the first question now. Have you published anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but maybe, uh, you know, uh, it's most, I, I'm really busy, so. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> um, but it'd be really cool to publish something. So if I have the time, I, I would absolutely love to. Yeah. Um, to answer, oh. Oh, no. oh, right. So that was question two. That was qu we'll question two is whether or not we had published any of this stuff, yeah. So, uh, qu question number one was about whether there are any resources about um, how graphs can, can create, um, I guess, uh, depthy narratives, kind of the type of stuff that, that, that we're interested in, in producing. Um, so I think there are two examples that don't exactly answer the question, but they are adjacent to that. So the first is a game which this guy showed me recently called uh, Unexplored, um, which uses a graph for the procedural generation of its dungeons. Um, so it uses these graphs to make sure that like uh, there aren't annoying cy cycles or you don't have to backtrack. It makes sure that the locks and keys are always kind of generated in interesting ways that will always ensure that the player has like content to traverse through. They're, they're, ne they're never going through dead space and never retreading anything. So that's an example of a game that's used a graph to kind of augment the delivery of content. Um, another example of using graphs in games is kind of academic, but it is really cool. So there's a framework that Microsoft produced called Text, I think it's called Text World. Um, it's basically, it's for reinforcement learning agents and mostly natural language processing agents. So Text World generates a random text adventure. Um, I don't know how it's it, not very fun. It's not very fun. It's if you were a human playing it, it it'd be dumb. Uh, but <laughs> it's uh, it's basically a description of some setting. The setting has objects, and the objects are supposed to be used on other objects to solve the next puzzle, to go to the next room, to solve the next puzzle, to go to the next room. Um, and the the uh, the problem is basically, can we make a model look at the current state? Uh, you know, evaluate which actions are available, take an action, and then solve the puzzle in as few steps as possible. 
Um, so one approach to this that some paper, uh, there's some paper pretty recently published, um, took the state, um, it, it tokenized, the, it used a thing called open IE to basically take the text description of the state of the game, turn that into a knowledge graph, um, and then it used the knowledge graph to help prune down the action space and it ended up converging on the answers much faster than solutions that just looked at the text and tried to predict what the what possible action they could take based on that text. So um, that's actually pretty similar to what we're doing, where we're using a graph to help pare down the action uh, the action space. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's midnight. Uh, we're out of time, but we would like to close the panel by trying to force you all to sing "Happy Birthday" for Clara Grace Page. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Clara. Happy birthday to you. You should have thought better than to come to our panel right before your birthday. <laughs> we have one last question. Well, we can we can take them in the hallway, maybe. Well, there's one last question okay. here. What's yeah, this? I don't I don't know if anybody <laughs> needs this room, so. Wait, this one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's a good question, and I think we have a slide for this. Um, it, 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 yeah, so um, it's up to the developer. It, it, it's it, for the most part that that's also up to the develop the game developer. Um, but we're we're introducing this new thing into the engine where edges can be typed according to uh, type vertices. So um, it's a uh, you can represent you you, you can represent. Um, we would encourage you to represent most relationships as edges rather than representing them as discrete vertices. But if you want the type of those edges to be more complex, you can have them refer to type vertices. So we know that hostile is a type of known re relationship, which is just in general a relationship. Um, so we have a kind of a we have an we have an ontology to define the type of that edge. So yeah. All right. Thank you and good night.